Good morning from New York or wherever you may be in the, um, around the globe uh, on your internet viewing this uh, endovascular live case. Uh, I'm George Dengas from the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratories of Mount Sinai Hospital. I have Dr. Jose Wiley with me. Good morning. Uh, we're going to be moderating a great case. And before we go there, I'd like to remind everybody that we, the registration for our live course, uh, cccsymposium.org, is a website and accepting uh, registrations for the June 17 to 19 uh, symposium here in New York City. Uh, very close to Times Square is going to be held this year and uh, it's going to give live cases of uh, coronary, uh, valve and vascular cases as well as personal interaction uh, with all of us, the, the faculty and operators uh, uh, of those cases for three days. Uh, without further delay, let's go to uh, PK and uh, Dr. Ferris in the cath lab to introduce today's case which is going to be a carotid intervention. Nine front sheet. Uh, George. Uh, thank you again for the nice introduction. Uh, we're really, it's a pleasure to see Dr. Peter Ferries working with us again in this, in this live case. He's our Chief of Vascular Surgery here at Monsanto, as George introduced. Um, I, we have a really wonderful case. As you know, we always try to show cases uh, with, with, with variety as well as with some, a lot of teaching points. And this particular case uh, is, is, is a, a case of Dr. Karthik Guja, who's one of our co-interventional endovascular attendings here. Uh, who basically uh, has this case. So I'm going to have uh, uh, Dr. Prashotham present the case and Dr. Guja, show me the top please, go, uh, up, go over the angiograms. Lo siento, senor. Lo siento. Yeah. Okay, very well. Let's start with the case presentation. We see the slides. Go away. Uh, morning, guys. So we have a 69-year-old gentleman with uh, history of TIAs with the uh, presentation of visual symptoms and some transient uh, right-sided weakness you know, in the last uh, six months or so. So he's uh, known to have significant uh, CAD with a history of uh, myocardial infarction. He's got uh, three vessel That's disease. Right. He's got a moderately depressed ejection fraction of 40%. In the past, he's had some PCIs done to his RCA with DES. And uh, relevant to this case, he's had a carotid endarterectomy back in 2011 uh, with uh, some history of uh, ischemic CVA. He's got uh, severe PAD uh, with multiple PTAs done to his legs. And recently underwent a left subclavian PTA and stenting. Also hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and BPH. His medications, he's on aspirin, Plavix, Coreg, isosorbide mononitrate, Lipitor, Losartan. He's on meds for his diabetes and BPH. And, uh, social history, he was an ex-smoker, otherwise non-contributory. Okay. Next slide, please. So uh, this morning in the ambulatory, his blood pressure was 168 over 92, otherwise... The uh, rest of the vital signs were pretty stable. He's got diminished pedal pulses and nothing else significant on the examination. Okay. Uh, Non-invasive imaging uh, on the carotid duplex uh, showed uh, elevated velocities of close to 310 uh, centimeters per second uh, in the distal uh, left CCA. Got it. So that's from the history and physical. You guys can take over from the angiograms. Yep. All right. Uh, Karthik, you want to just scrub out and show the history and physical downstairs? Uh, on the, uh, actually, you don't have to scrub out. Can somebody, can somebody go put the history and physical up? Actually, I can't right now because I'm yeah. going to have to show we got what we We got the history and physical very well. We have uh, some symptoms were, uh, I guess, uh, visual symptoms. We did not get which eye it is and the laterality. We got a right-sided weakness. Is, uh, uh, so maybe we can get a little bit more explanation from Dr. Guja yeah. regarding the time and laterality yeah. of the symptoms. Dr. Dang, so his, 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 uh, his symptoms were three months ago, okay. so he started having cardiac symptoms also, so he, was, he actually has severe three vessel disease. Yeah. So yeah. he's yeah. actually yeah. planned for a bypass after we do the uh, carotid stenting. So let me just, uh, uh, I think PK is flowing because of the wire position, so let me just go over the angiogram. I'll give you an idea of what he has. He has a bovine arch, that's why we are having difficulty getting the equipment through and we are trying to watch it. So he had a significant left subclavian stenosis, which we stented uh, about uh, two weeks ago because he's planned for a bypass. Um, so we, they wanted uh, Lima uh, to be used, so we stented the subclavian. So he had the CEA done three years ago, and then uh, he was actually asymptomatic until three months ago when he had these symptoms. And they did a, they did a CAT scan, and they found that he had a mild MCA infarct. So... 
You and he right was right MCA infarct. The, the, that's right. Left MCA. Uh, yeah, he had right-sided symptoms. Left MCA infarct. Left MCA. So okay. that's when he was referred to me uh, for evaluation. When I did the uh, ultrasound, okay. on the ultrasound, it was uh, it was pretty clear that he had a uh, doubling of his velocities in the CCA, in the distal CCA, actually. So uh, we wh brought him. Wh which side is that now? So left-sided. So his right, he, his right side ICA velocities were uh, slightly on the higher side, probably around 150, I think, and uh, diastolics were around 45, 50, so mm -hmm. it's 50 to 69 percent stenosis. Uh, that's what angiographically it correlates, actually. And then uh, when Let's we did the, the uh, pictures uh, of uh, the left-sided uh, CCA, uh, you can clearly see it's a bovine arch. Comes the, the left-sided common carotid mm -hmm. comes off from the right brachiocephalic. Yeah. Uh, that's why we had to use a VTEC catheter here, and PK will go through that. Um, and when we took the picture, the distal CCA looks like it's almost like a clamp injury he had like long time ago. You can clearly see the clips where the stenosis is. It's almost like an eccentric fibrotic plaque. Even on the ultrasound, it looked like that. Angiographically, also, it looks like that. Um, so it looks like the, he probably had a clamp injury and he started developing plaque over the clamp injury. And then uh, I guess uh, that's... So that's es essentially, we're dealing about the stenosis okay. at the site of the previous... Yeah, uh, so you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna although it's not exactly I at the site, it's just a little bit proximal. That's right. But that is the area of, the, uh, uh, of interest. Yeah, I, so I think uh, Dr. Dangus, Dr. Dr. George, Ferris is here. So George, I think what we should do is have Karthik scrub out and show the film over there. I yep. think that no, you can't show it here because we're going to work here. Okay, Karthik, you're going to have to scrub out. I'm going to show it. And this is the arch as well. Yeah, sure. So go ahead. So picture yeah let's do the DSA. so let me go over the oh, arch the and everything with you oh, right. Good. Right. so he has a coronary at the same time over there. so this is uh, okay. this is your uh, picture of the arch so normally what we do is we give uh, about right. 10 so 20 right. and about 1000 cc of dye right. so you can clearly see he has left subclavian stenosis here right. uh, proximal left room. subclavian stenosis Plenty and his uh, a bovine and, arch. Uh, and the bovine arch mm -hmm. the left common carotid comes off from the right brachiocephalic we, uh, we were not able to engage it with any other catheter. I mean, actually, VTEC is probably better for these kind of uh, arches anyways. Right. So then we took uh, selective images well, of the right side. The, the, the right By side far. clearly shows that the ICA is probably around 50%, 60%, not more than that. Not really, yeah. It's very mild. Did you open yeah. the TUI or no? And then you can clearly Did see the 50 to 69 percent the ultrasound correlates. It, Roadmap? Let's do it on the road and map this, we always take a lateral shot to see the MCA area. And then the okay. anti, uh, of course, the Tom's view to see well, any crossover. So you can see some crossover in the leptomeningeals. Right. So uh, it's a little bit of a 50% of the, of, the, of the right carotid system and uh, nothing much back. else so far. N nothing Very much good. else so far, just that the, she has some crossovers in the, uh, the, in the circulation. On so, so we tried using a JB1 catheter. Probably and then the finally we came to the VTEC catheter to take picture. This is his subclavian, clearly. There was a gradient of 60, uh, and we took care of that. Yeah. Then we engaged right, guys, the. Let's get the, uh, let's get the balloon up. That's a big gradient. Oh, uh, Dan, are these half strengths? Those are all half strengths. So this is his ICA. So his ECA is totally occluded from before. Well, that's a so good thing. That the makes the procedure easy. You want uh, coronary? Right. So this is his picture. Exactly. Okay, now what we understand. So the endotracomy side is very. It's very good. It's just that there is a proximal, most likely a clamp injury, as you described it. Yes. And I see you fix also the access side from the right femoral, right uh, external ilia. Yeah. So that's yeah, your regular coronary. So you can clearly see you can see the cl clearly see the clips actually. Right. These are the clips area. So. Yeah. And you and you can see when we take a picture, you can see right at the clips. Right, you can see right around. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right okay. So it looks like wherever they put a clamp, he probably had some kind of a dissection flap, which probably and healed. Plaque, yeah. And then he started developing plaque over it. It's very unusual Silly. to see plaque in the distal CCA like that, uh, if it's a if it's a native uh, um, carotid artery disease. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you agree, um, Dr. Dangus and Dr. Wiley. So. Hey, Dr. Goyer, you're you calling what that a what a 70% lesion or something like that? I'm sorry. What degree of stenosis are you calling so that on by? The NASA? On, on the ultrasound, based on the velocities, because it's doubled. Okay. So in the in the common carotids, we can only call just like in the 
Um, just like in the peripherals, we can call doubling of velocities as more than 50% so stenosis. Mm -hmm. So for common carotids, anything more than 50% stenosis is significant okay. enough. So his velocities were around 350 and his uh, common carotid in the proximal were around 75. So he almost had like tripling, quadrupling velocities. So I call it more than 50% and oh, yeah. he came in and I mean, I mean angiographically I would All call right, it 70 to 80%. Point. Yeah. All right guys, let's come back to the case here. Uh, Dr. Guja, thank you what? so much for that. Now I want to show you what Sick. we've done. Go scene minus please. Um, guys, so you can go one more, one more. So what we did here was, so Dr. Ferries and I, uh, uh, <laughs> as well as Dr. Guja, discussed this case. The options for this case, I'll let Dr. Ferries talk about uh, the, the approach, the endovascular approach, and what's the pathophysiology of this particular case, Dr. Dr. Ferries, this clamp injury. Well, so typically what will occur is when the uh, clamp is placed on the vessel, it's, it's normally atraumatic, but in a certain patient population, they'll have a, uh, a, a response to injury, essentially, and intimal hyperplasia will develop at the site of clamp placement. It's quite similar to the animal hyperplasia we see after uh, balloon angioplasty, for example. Uh, and it's a typically a progressive uh, response uh, and does frequently, if the patient is symptomatic, mandates uh, intervention. Now, the lesions themselves are quite uh, different than a primary atherosclerotic lesion. It's uh, more fibrotic uh, because of the animal hyperplasia. I'll leave it up, yeah, open for a while. Uh, and as a result, it, the embolic potential from intervention is quite a bit lower. There are several options for intervention. Obviously, you could do a repeat surgical intervention uh, and endarterectomize that segment or patch angio, do a surgical patch angioplasty of that injured uh, uh, stenotic segment. But again, you risk uh, placing a clamp further proximally and uh, inducing a second uh, animal hyperplastic response. So what we have found with restenosis after prior endarterectomy or in cases such as this where you have a clamp injury, uh, balloon angioplasty is a very good uh, alternative. It doesn't generate uh, any significant amount of debris or emboli uh, and uh, it can be highly efficacious. Uh, it also avoids a repeat surgery within a scarred surgical field and so avoids the potential for cranial nerve injury or other um, difficulties that might be encountered in a reoperative uh, operative field. Um, so in this instance, I think what we'll do is, is an angioplasty. We've uh, discovered that because these fibrotic lesions are quite uh, resistant to dilatation, the use of a cutting balloon can be uh, very beneficial in terms of getting your initial uh, response and your initial luminal gain, and so that's what we'll utilize in this case as well. So, so Dr. Ferris, can you talk a little bit about the choice of distal protection or protection here, and then we can and then we can talk about the options, and then we can talk about why we chose what we chose. So there, are, letting it breathe. there are there are a number of options. What has been shown, I think, in some of the the <coughs> uh, pivotal <laughs> trials for these devices is that in symptomatic lesions, uh, they tend to be more unstable, and the use of proximal protection has resulted in fewer embolic events, at least in those uh, non-randomized uh, uh, clinical trials. Uh, and we have shown preference for and have had excellent results in symptomatic patients with the use of proximal protection. Uh, in this instance, it's a little bit of a challenge for two reasons. One, the lesion is in the common carotid. So uh, since MoMA is the only uh, device that's currently being utilized for proximal protection, it has an external balloon. Yep. And that balloon we're gonna maintain in position uh, uh, proximal to the stenosis itself to allow us to treat that. There's a second balloon that's the common carotid balloon, and that's inflated currently. Uh, and so we've got flow cessation right now, and when we do active aspiration, we'll have a reversal of flow. So let me just go over what we did. So what, what we did was, as Dr. Guja so nicely decide, uh, discussed, we went ahead and we, we got a VTEC catheter. Can you talk about crossing the lesion with an 035 glide wire here? Well, it's... A, it's uh, it, it, because it's a common carotid lesion, it's going to have access and, and device challenges. And one of them is where would you uh, place your uh, wire? In this case, we elected to cross the lesion because it is, we believe, to be intimal hyperplasia uh, and less prone to disruption. Uh, we did elect to cross it with a glide wire. The alternative would be to try to position a uh, stiffer wire, such as an Amplatz wire, with a very short uh, floppy segment proximal to the lesion. And that can be undertaken as well, although in this case, we felt that uh, it would be safe to cross the lesion with the glide wire. So then once we cross the lesion with the glide wire, we went ahead and tracked the, the, the MoMA catheter, which we'll, we'll talk about briefly, has a proximal and a distal balloon occlusion. The proximal balloon occlusion is the ECA balloon occlusion port, which would ideally fit into the external carotid. 
but here because of the surgical site, the external carotid is occluded, and then the distal occlusion is also going to be there, which is fine. So the distal occlusion balloon is right now where? It's proximal to the stenosis in the common carotid artery. And the other balloon, the proximal one? That is also in, the, that's about 10 centimeters further proximal in the common carotid, but it's, pr it's distal to the, the origin of the common carotid off uh, the so brachis valve. Sounds valve. like in this case, we only need the one balloon. Uh, correct, because correct. The, uh, because the external so is occluded, so we don't bother with the second one. That makes uh, the, the, the situation a little bit easier. Of course, uh, taking the MoMA device there, how challenging was or was it easily done via the, the uh, glide wire? Uh, I'd like to, I think that's a critical point as far as uh, device delivery. Okay, so what we've done here is you can see here in the bottom part, or part of the screen that the, the distal balloon is occluded. And, and you can see that there's diastasis showing there's flow cessation. Dr. Ferries and I had injected while Dr. Guja was showing, showing a column of blood. So there's currently flow cessation. I've got the distal port open as for what Dr. Ferries has discussed to continue the reversal of flow. And now we're going to go ahead and, and, and introduce the cutting balloon. So you can see here that the wire is up top. Cutting and I'm just going to go ahead gently. And what we've decided to use here yeah, is a 20 millimeter 60, 20, right guys? 6020. Uh, uh, a scoring balloon, sort of similar to a, a, a cutting balloon, but in the, in the same family. And what we're going to do here is score the plaque uh, with this balloon. Now, we've got CT measurements of this being around 9 millimeter common carotid, so we're okay with this choosing the 6. A little bit of resistance, wire's coming back. So we're just going to push the wire forward. Again, we're on complete flow reversal here, so it should be okay. So but we're just going to go forward with this balloon. And you're going to see here, Dr. Wiley, as it's coming out, a little bit of difficulty coming out of the distal port here. Uh, you know why? That's because we're through. Yeah, the, the, uh, the problem we have uh, the, uh, uh, the logistics of this case is that uh, it's not yeah, very clear where the lesion is unless you mark it in the wow. tape. Now, now, uh, now i got to tell you, this is, this is a great teaching point. We're through the distal port here, and Dr. Ferry, because remember, when you go through the external port, this is what's going to happen. So now we've got to find the internal port or the, or the common port to take the wire out through the common port in order to be able to go. And then we still, looks like we're still through the external port. And maybe a better C curve might be, ah, there you go. That seems to be it. That's it. Now you're out of it. See, now, I don't know if everybody at home can see what we, we're seeing, how there's a difference in the movement of the wire. It's next to it rather than on top of it. So that's an important point to understand that it's very easy for this to go through the distal external port rather than the proximal common port. And now we're having trouble getting it into the uh, internal, which again, I can always advance the speed, yeah. right? Yeah, Let me the just advance this. Coming back. That's there you go. You got the yeah, the better if you get the yeah, J. Yeah. That's the best. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us a little, how you got the, the equipment up there if uh, the external carotid is occluded? Where did, did you park the 035 wire to have enough yeah, support to advance your device? Table. Yeah, so we, 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 uh, were th we thought carefully about that, and, and we elected to cross the common carotid stenosis, advance the wire, and as you point out, the external carotid is occluded, and that's what allows us to use the MoMA in this uh, instance. Uh, and uh, we advanced the 035 glide wire into the internal carotid for a short distance. Okay. okay. All right across. Mm -hmm. You want me to close this now? Yeah, please. And don't withdraw back. Mm -hmm. Ready? Sorry, guys. No drawback. No drawback. Because you, you, you should be able to get a little bit. Just make sure there's no air. Okay, so draw back a little bit. So we're just drawing back a little bit just to make sure there's no air. And it looks like there is no air. And now we're going to just take a quick picture. And you can see you're perfectly right there across the lesion as we talk yeah. with the proximal port. Now let's go up with this balloon, guys. And you can see now on the flora, you're going to be under flow cessation. You see that? So there is no flow in this vessel at this stage. Oh, that's beautiful. So there's no chance of distal embolization. Dr. Ferris? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a perfect slowly. example of flow cessation. Slowly. Sometimes with this device, you know, you'll have the external balloon in the origin of the external, but it won't be fully occlusive of the superior thyroid, uh, which is okay. It, it doesn't generate a significant anti-grade flow into the... Uh, internal carotid, but in this case, you've got complete cessation because there is no outflow via the external carotid. Is your patient tolerating? He, he, yeah. Is he asleep or what? Hey, no, he's awake he's and awake. responsive. Okay. Wow, that's tight. You can see that. Look how tight that On is. The atmosphere? Car, I think it's only three atmospheres. 
Six atmospheres, which is nominal for this balloon. All right, go to seven. Well, you always worry about damaging the carotid uh, yeah, distally, this, so. This, this balloon is a little bit. Uh, Again, this highlights how difficult these lesions can be to, uh, because of the fibrotic yeah. nature of the lesion, how difficult they can be to dilate. I think you're getting some dilatation there. Is he having any uh, dolor? Dolor or no dolor? A little, little bit. It's dilating though. It's, 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 it's I wouldn't be better to, to have this uh, lesion more in the towards the center of the balloon. Well, you know, George, since it's a scoring balloon, uh, you can see the limitations we had with proximal protection. You're right. Uh, ideally speaking, you're absolutely right. But I think here with very judicious, slow balloon angioplasty, you can see we were able to open the lesion. And now we're just going to wait for the balloon to come down. Patient is rock solid stable. And you see you have, we have total sl uh, flow cessation. So now we're going to walk this out slowly and then go ahead and put our stent. You're absolutely right. I mean, ideally speaking, the device that's off the market, which Dr. D Dr. Ferries, I think, alluded to, was the device by W.L. Gore and Company. You need to open this, right? We'll put the by by Gore and Co. We'll, uh, put okay, senor. What's that? Lo siento, lo siento. It's, it's normal. It's coughing okay, a little okay. bit. You want me to open this? Uh, in a second, yeah. Okay, tell me when. Okay. Well, you can open it now. Mm -hmm. Tell me when you want me to open it. Okay, now we're going to open this again. Give a little bit of negative flow. So, so the Gore device is probably the normal device. Is it Aculing? 10.040. So the Gore device only has one balloon, George, as you know. And unfortunately, it's off the market. It's really not even worth talking about. So at this stage right now, this is what we're left with. Yeah. Now, now Peter, can this be done with distal protection or no? Yes. Yeah, this, this type of lesion could. has low embolic potential. And so uh, for that regard... For that reason, I think it's reasonable to utilize uh, a filter. <laughs> Another approach for this might be to utilize a guide system, uh, eight French guide system, and then use an uh, O14 uh, or, or wire uh, related uh, distal filter approach. Now, the thing, to the thing to bear in mind, George, in this case is the reason we can do this is we don't have to occlude the external. It's already occluded. Right. If it were, uh, if it were patent, then we'd have to advance the uh, MoMA device into the external and, and probably and do this whole manipulation yep. uh, with the uh, MoMA past the stent. It, would, yep. it can be done, but it's uh, less attractive uh, an alternative. As you know, I mean, the, I mean, as you so know, as I mean, as far as the wire, as far as the wire support, go ahead, Pete. As as far as the wire support, what we have is, I got floor. Uh, we actually have a 014 stiff Grand Slam wire, um, coronary Grand Slam <coughs> to wire, which is giving us a lot of support. So again, uh, you know, as far as glycopyrrolate, wow. Dr. Ferries, would you give glyco in this case? I would not. W okay, no, uh, which is which <laughs> is what we did not do in this case. So so therefore, you know, because there's no involvement of the of the carotid uh, baroreceptors in the bulb, I think it's it's okay here not to give glyco. So now the deployment of the stent is going to be challenging because we have a 40 stent, and you saw that the lesion is is a little bit off. So here we're going to have to go. We're going to have to deploy it and then pull the device back and then allow the stent. Uh, to expand after the device comes back. I so think this is a good position, but do you want to just confirm? Yep, chair grab yep, go ahead. McCarthy, pull back slow, a little bit. Just make sure we're not taking yep. any air in from here. So it's very tight, so we're going to make sure that we're going to very slowly pull back to make sure we don't get any air. Yeah, so air. you can see here that, uh, you know, all these little, little steps are what's really going to help us prevent very having slow, any problems. So we have a little bit of bleeding because of the back bleeding, and that's something you guys have to get used to. <coughs> so we're going to take a quick picture here. I'm not so sure the picture is uh, with such a long stand. I'm not so sure the picture is necessary. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, um, so there you go. So there's your, your lesion. You can even pr probably extend this yeah. into, the c into the internal, but I'm going to let Dr. Ferry's comment on that. Uh, you can pull back. You can see where the, uh, I don't think it's necessary. You certainly can. Uh, I don't think there's any reason necessarily to do so. You can see where our pre-dilatation balloon was. Right. We're going to want to at least cover that. Uh, actually, you're in a pretty good position. As long as we don't yeah. shift forward during right. deployment, you should be fine. So we go ahead and unlock. Because Dr. Gooch is going to go ahead and deploy the stent. You can see, again, we have full flow cessation. And, uh, you know, the, the highlights here is really to, to sh illustrate some of the challenges. If, if somebody's going to do carotid stenting, they're going to have to learn to handle this because appropriate therapy for carotid is, is surgical predominantly and also partially end endovascular. So here, the, the, in order to be able to deal with the surgical restenosis, uh, I think a, a team-based approach using um, uh, the, the collaboration between the endovascular physician and the endovascular surgeon 
uh, to be able to sit and work together in, in order to be able to fix what is probably a, a the best therapy for the patient, which may be surgical or endovascular, dependent on what the consensus is going to be. So I really implore everyone to really start that kind of program in, in their pr respective uh, uh, you know, practices, because I think in Sinai here, we've been able to accomplish it, and, uh, you know, and I've been, we've been doing really quite well with it. So yeah, and and I think it makes for much better patient outcomes, uh, you know, when it's with this team approach, no and question. And you can see here, Dr. Guja is very methodically uh, uh, deploying the stent. So you can see here the stent is deployed now, completely deployed, right? Or are you having a little bit of trouble? Okay, completely deployed. You have to uh, release the, st uh, the, uh, the uh, stop cock. Right, uh, which is what we're doing now. Tui, yeah. Oh, okay, perfect, and here it comes. So you can see that it's it, that, that, that it, you're right, you're right, George. That's a very good point. The stopper had to be released, and now and now we're taking everything out here, and you can see that the back bleeding is occurring because we've got we've got the two E open, the and uh, and and so so the back bleeding occurs. So any embolic debris is gonna is gonna come back because of the flow cessation. I want everybody to look at the distal balloon, the distal marker you see on the screen. You can see this dye that's constantly stasis there, showing that you've got complete occlusion proximally, so you don't have to worry about things getting, getting embolized distally. So now, uh, we're now, now that we've removed it... Uh, we may not need anything, we'll see. We might, are we going to aspirate now? Uh, yeah. So now what, what we're going to do is, as per our protocol, we're going to take two 20cc syringes and aspirate out any of the debris in that, and at the last, I I uh, 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 this one right here, at the last uh, uh, aspiration, we, we will I go down, know. we will go down with the balloon as we're, yeah. as we're aspirating. Right. So you can see here that, that uh, Dr. Guja is aspirating the 20cc syringe. And remember that uh, that's really not the port you should be doing it because you see it's sucking air. Yeah, I mean, you should really be doing it in... No, no, no. no that's yeah. A okay, that's a common point. So, what is your protocol uh, with this de device? Do you inflate Blue the back. distal first, and then the proximal b balloon, and then deflate the distal, and then the proximal? Or what is your protocol? Uh -huh. What's that? What's that? Tell me again. What is your protocol of uh, in deflating your balloons after okay. you're done? Is I it the distal first, and then the proximal, usually or the proximal and then the distal? Does it make any difference? When you're using both balloons up, you you want it. You want to first aspirate. And then after you aspirate, you, you want to drop the proximal balloon, which is the external carotid balloon, first. Then, as you're aspirating your second syringe, you want to drop your distal balloon, which is your common carotid balloon. You also want to use judicious judgment. You can see here Dr. Ferries and Dr. Guja were talking about air coming back. So we're just going to let it bleed back, let gravity yeah. do its job and, and, and push, push everything back uh, and ra ra rather than try to pull. So we're, we're going let to let about 20 cc's of blood come out of that before, before we go ahead and drop this balloon. Yeah, I think the, uh, <coughs> the uh, opening of the sheath is up against the wall of the proximal common carotid. So when we try to aspirate, it just sucks it into the wall and won't allow you know, us to... The audio screen cannot see the, uh, the ports of the MoMA de device. Do, do you mind focusing on that? So, so The what? Here. The uh, ports of the MoMA device. Okay, so sure. People can see what we're talking about. All right, okay, so you see here, that's the proximal port, right? And that's the distal port. And you see the diastasis that I was talking about? So, yeah. so those are the two ports of the MoMA device. So, so therefore, you know, the, the whole point is, you can see that, that you've actually, uh, help, uh, you know, uh, having reversal of flow here wh while we are, we are doing this intervention as was demonstrated by the diastasis. So, so you know, the Gore device would have made it a lot easier for us to do it. Unfortunately, it's not in the market, but clearly the MoMA device is actually a little bit more better because you, don't, you are a little bit better, more better, bad English, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> so forgive better. me, more better, right? A uh, uh, little bit better, uh, an improvement because you don't have to have a venous access along with your arterial access. Your conduit, so your, your sheet size is the nine, which is also a, a limitation. But here we felt it was a good demonstration of this device in a very complicated uh, lesion of the common carotid. Uh, you know, again, the options for everyone out there is if, if you feel that, hey, you know what, I can get this done with a, with a distal protection device, that's absolutely fine. We wanted to show you that, that this particular device does work in this particular type of difficult lesion. Now so, but, but, and you see the challenges that we faced. Uh, in terms of uh, post-dilatation, uh, we know that most of the embolization occurs in post-dilation rather than pre-dilation. Do you uh, post-dilate these uh, common carotid lesions? or I'm going to let Dr. Ferries answer that question. Yeah, I mean, obviously, 
post dilatation is the point of greatest risk because that's where you're uh, you know going to the greatest diameter, so you're applying the most force to the to the uh, carotid lesion. Uh, and so we have been quite judicious in uh, post dilatation with uh, you know smaller balloons and accepting a, a mild uh, residual stenosis. In this case, I think the best thing will be to to uh, see what our arteriographic image is. Uh, and see if we, in fact, even need a post dilatation. We're prepared to do so. Do you yeah. think there's any role of uh, uh, transcranial Doppler when we're doing these pr procedures? For instance, if uh, well, you, you know, the pre dilatation and you have uh, significant uh, uh, microbiotic events, whether you want to post dilate or not? I think that uh, it is not uh, at this point part of the standard therapy, standard approach that's utilized, but I think as a research tool, it can be quite uh, uh, informative and illustrative. So. Uh, obviously, we're utilizing it here in our, our research protocol. I think uh, it would have to have demonstrated utility before it would be uh, become a standard of therapy for these patients. Dr. Guja, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, type of m medical therapy, antiplatelet therapy, etc., you have uh, implied in this patient? Is this patient on high-intensity statins and Plavix so from the get-go? So the patient uh, is on uh, high-intensity statins because he started having unstable angina symptoms about uh, four weeks ago. So he's on Lipitor of 80. Um, he is getting uh, Metaprolol. He, his EF is completely normal, like good for him. Um, so he's on uh, l uh, Metaprolol of 50 twice a day. He's only tolerating 50 twice a day Metaprolol. And then he's on uh, ACE inhibitors, as he's on. Um, and of course, he's on Renexa for his anti anginal therapy. Antiplatelet-wise aspirin. So uh, the surgeons are OK to do the um, bypass on Plavix. So I think after this 10 placement, he's going to be on a month uh, of uh, Plavix, which I think uh, they're going to operate on Plavix, they said. So they don't have any issues with that. You know, uh, George, I think this is also a good opportunity. Uh, I think that's a great point. You bring up medical therapy is incredibly important in this and maybe probably the most important part of what we do. And that kind of takes us right into our next discussion point. Now that I have yourself, Dr. Ferries, Dr. Wiley, Dr. Guja here about Crest 2. What are your thoughts on Crest 2? Uh, I mean, uh, are you guys excited? Uh, what, what do you think the outcomes will be? Any predictions? What are the ideas? Ready? Yeah, we can take a picture. Well, uh -huh. I think, uh, I think Crest, cr Crest yeah, 2 is essentially an NIHLBI study uh, with the optimal medical therapy, including high intensity statin and uh, cyanopyridine uh, <coughs> antiplatelet therapy. Uh, for patients with carotid disease as compared with the vascularization. Essentially, it's a rehash of earlier trials that had compared medical therapy with uh, uh, endarterectomy, uh, but this time it allows any mode of revascularization without the randomization there and, uh, and elevates or intensifies, if you want, the medical therapy to the current standards uh, as opposed to uh, perhaps uh, uh, simple aspirin or uh, maybe low dose uh, uh, cholesterol lowering uh, that was employed according to the guidelines uh, 15 or uh, so years, uh, 20 maybe, 25 years ago when those original studies had occurred. Mm -hmm. So clearly the comparator is gonna be a tougher, uh, a tougher one to beat this time around. And uh, clearly there will be a, a, a a, a, a real good comparison uh, between maybe uh, the procedure related to um, some kind of periprocedural events and what is, it, uh, the, what is there to gain by the medical therapy arm having events uh, along the course of the follow-up. So in my mind, the longer the follow-up, the better chance the, uh, the invasive therapy will have if the study is realized with a slow enrollment and ends up having a relatively short um, uh, uh, mean average follow-up, uh, I think that may uh, make the results a little bit, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, statistically more favorable for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the medical therapy arm and, and a little bit diff diff more difficult bar to overcome for the, uh, uh, for the uh, intervention arm. At the same time, the protection devices for stents as well as the perfection of the uh, uh, endarterectomy uh, procedures uh, with uh, lighter anesthesia and shunts, etc., might be uh, m might also be a very important improvement compared to uh, to prior. Yep, that's a great point, George. Now we're just going to finish up and let Dr. Ferry's comment on it. So he's going to let go of the proximal balloon. You're going to see. I'm going to go up. 
So now that we, we saw the picture, the picture showed very good uh, uh, apposition of the, of the stent with, with the reduction of the uh, stenosis. Now the proximal balloon just went down as Dr. Perry is just uh, taking it down. Now we're completely off protection. So the patient is not protected at this stage. So it's important to remember that when you're doing this now, you, you, you need to have your manifold and all those other things very, very nicely situated where you're not injecting saline or contrast or anything through the device because you're completely off protection at this stage. So you're aspirating at this time? Yeah, we absolutely we have it open. And, and Dr. Ferries, go ahead. Now remember, we had a little bit of trouble aspirating. So we let it bleed for a quite, a, quite a bit of time. So now, now that we're negative, the pressure's back. You can see, I don't know if you can see the manifold. Now we're going to just walk this out. I'm going to let Dr. Ferries walk it out here while I hold the sheet. We'll take a quick picture. Okay, Dr. Gujo will now prep up the device and uh, make sure that there's no air again in, 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 our, in our system. And it's no air, as you can see. Yeah, so we're now, now we're going to go ahead and do a DSA picture. We'll do a brain shots, and then we'll be done in a second. Of okay, course, uh, that, that room has uh, the assisted device, and you chose to use the ma manifold. Any reason for that? Well, we've always used the manifold, Dr. Wiley, as you know, with the carotids. We just we'll put it on DSA, uh, Bhaskar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can, you know that uh, you know at least all of us, uh, the four of us who are doing carotid stents. Uh, uh, well actually, all of us who do them together, the five of us together, uh, generally speaking, don't don't like uh, the assist. We just like the manifold. Uh, so here we go. Uh, although the assist has been studied, um, you know, has been used by multiple can centers. Can we see in, the, in our field of angiography? Can we include the bifurcation a little bit better? Yep, we are. We just wanted to take a look at the residual yep. stenosis. Uh, go minus, guys. Uh, I mean, go, yeah. go yeah. reduce yeah. the mag for me. I did, I did. And then shut her in, guys. Let's yeah, shut that's her in. great. Thank you. Show me a little higher. There you go. Perfect. So we can take another picture here. Dr. Guj is ready. Señor, aguanta la respiración. Bote del aire. And no trague, señor. There you go. So you can see, as Dr. Ferry's point, there is a residual, you know, 10%, 15%. It's not something that we're going to go crazy after. You saw that the cutting balloon was up quite high. And you can see here that uh, there is a little residual. And I think we're fine with that, I believe. Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn for everybody. But I know I'm fine with this right here. Well, the other thing is that, uh, that we were up at 10 atmospheres with a 6 balloon. And, uh, and got pretty good uh, resolution. Uh, come off, Laura. Uh, pretty good resolution of the stenosis. But uh, I, I don't think we would would want to go to a MCA well let's just do lateral and then we'll do the lateral brain i think i'll be hesitant to uh go to higher atmospheres or a larger balloon uh yeah i don't you know i don't want to induce any sort of damage or injury to the uh, that's carotid perfect. vessel that's perfect. well uh, six millimeter is a little bit uh, uh, one could say a little undersized for the common mm -hmm. carotid at the same time you're not going to go crazy with uh, achieving a 0% residual. It's probably 5% in this view. It was maybe around 10% in the previous view. Um, so overall, we accept the 5 to 10% residual and, and be happy. I think the stent has expanded to maybe even 7.5 up top uh, on its own. And um, well, I think well, that's great. Well, the, the stent that we chose, which we did not discuss, I think is an important point. And I'm going to let Dr. Ferries discuss that as well as you, George, and Jose. Uh, uh, we chose a 1040 straight, 10-1040 uh, straight. So, I, you know, I don't believe personally to use uh, tapered stents in common carotids. I don't know whether Dr. Ferries has a preference uh, or you, George, and uh, Jose. But as far as me and Dr. Gujo, we discussed this at length. And we're like, there's no reason for us to use a tapered stent when we do have a, uh, a, a straight stent that's available. So that's why we went ahead and got the straight stand here. Straight stand is fine here. It wasn't significant taper anyhow in this particular exactly. vessel. Exactly. And I think that's important for everybody to, to understand is use, you use what you need in order to get the case done. How about and the issue of closed cell versus open cell? What's, uh, what was your take on this site? Well, you know, that's a, a, a very interesting point. There are uh, mixed results, uh, whether there is a difference or not. Some studies have shown a fewer embolic events with a closed cell stent. Closed cell stents have a smaller free cell area, and as a result, you want to have a look at your head? Yep, Liz, you're going to have to adjust them. As a result, there's <coughs> sort of less open space between the stent struts uh, through which yep. emboli can uh, become dislodged uh, during or after the procedure, Perfect. after the placement of the stent. So, I, sort of intuitively, a closed cell stent may have some advantage uh, with respect to stability of the plaque. Uh, it's not as flexible as an open cell, 
uh, stent. So with, with respect to delivery and then um, straightening of the carotid vessel after deployment of the stent, the, the open cell stents, I think, are better for that. So in I this case, what, they, what did you guys use? Well, this was open cell. This was, uh, I think this was oh, AccuLink. It was close cell. Oh, it was AccuLink. It's AccuLink. Yeah, it's AccuLink. I'm sorry. It's AccuLink. So I think that's actually open cell. Okay. But again, I think the embolic potential oh, of so a, a restenotic lesion is, is uh, much, much lower. So, oh, yeah, so in, in a straight segment, I'm not sure that it makes much of a difference. Uh, on, on the other hand, maybe, maybe the residual might have been yep. closer yep. to 5% of, of the closed up. cell. We, we, don't, we don't know. But the result is great. So and you can see when Dr. Ferris is taking it out. To deliver. The delivery and yep. the removal of the device uh -huh. is the most critical it's part of this procedure. Yeah. I see that beautifully. And so Dr. Ferris is now just taking this out now. We just came out over a wire, and now it's, it's completely out of the body. I'm just going to hold the sheet as we come out. Patient is neurologically intact. There's no issues. We check, we're going to check him completely. Our neurologist is, is going to go ahead and see him uh, right after this as per our protocol here, and had seen him before. So um, I, I think that we've, we've, got a, we've got a great uh, case and a demonstration of this particular type of uh, uh, you know, lesion subset. And I think you know, part of our goal here at, at this particular course and the feedback we've gotten from everybody is that the variety of cases, and I think this case really illustrates, uh, Dr. Ferry so, and all of us here have done uh, cases live with internal carotid, both in the symposium as well as in, in our peripheral intervention uh, webcast, but we've never done a common carotid, and I think you are going to you know, see these cases in your practice, and you need to know how to handle it. The, uh, this was a great presentation, a very challenging case. Before a bypass, you occluded external carotid, the previous endarterectomy, the clamp injury. We discussed the uh, uh, proximal protection device and uh, all the iterations regarding the, uh, the scoring balloon as well as the uh, uh, accepting the mild residual stenosis in the end, if um, minimal really under 10%. And, uh, you know, we discussed the medical therapy and the upcoming trial. Yep. So it was a very well-rounded presentation. And, and I'd like and to uh, and George, uh, thank what, you just and thing, uh, Peter just about this. Remind the audience that Dr. Ferries is going to present uh, 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 an update. I know he always talks about the carotid with us because it's his uh, area of, of, of expertise uh, beyond other things. But, but the point here is that I think uh, right afterwards he'll have a nice presentation mm -hmm. giving an update for us, just about a 20-minute presentation. So you guys should log in and see that as well. Again, I, I thank Dr. Ferries for taking time out of his busy schedule, sir. Thank a you, pleasure, Dr. Pleasure. Guja. Thanks, thank you again, Dr. Bosker. Right. And I failed to introduce my team, and I apologize. You know, I've got. Let's we forgot see the team, Dr. Guja. Got, move aside, please. We've got we've got Eliz <laughs> so we can Elizabeth, see our, our our wonderful, beautiful nurse, Liz and Ricky, our handsome young tech. And uh, you know, we really appreciate their support. I know that uh, we could not get anything done without them, and our vascular surgery, surgery fellow Daniel as well. Thank Great. you again, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, PK. Let's uh, come back. Uh, Jose, any uh, wrap-up uh, note about this case? What was the most exciting part for you? You know, I think the uh, pro probably the deployment and, uh, and maneuvering, utilizing this proximal protection the, the device is not as commonly used as perhaps may should be may be used. Mm. Uh, I just w wanted to ask at the end, uh, how are you guys going to close the access site? Uh, did you I uh, put an angel seal. Was, yeah, was they was an angel seal. Yeah, they did an angel seal. And uh, I, I think to me, the uh, deployment of the device in a bovine arch and um, you know how they, they took it around safely, that's the most uh, important part of the procedure as far as safety. From then on, once you have the device in the common carotid proximally, it's all, it's all downhill and uh, worked out very well. So let me remind everyone that to stay tuned. Uh, Dr. Ferris will give a brief uh, slide set presentation uh, uh, very soon at the very website. If you have any questions, you could email them to us regarding this presentation at info at peripheralinterventions.org. Info at peripheralinterventions.org and either myself, Dr. Wiley, or any of the operators will uh, respond to you. And they will have a blog that you can follow. And this case, in case you missed some part of it, uh, it will be in the archives of the website that you are now, the www.peripheralinterventions.org. Uh, and in the same archives, you can find all our previous uh, live cases. Uh, before I close, let me uh, remind you that the uh, live case symposium of coronary valve and vascular cases will be held here in New York at the AXA Center near uh, Times Square, just behind Times Square. Um, and uh, on uh, June 17, 18, and 19, 
and the website uh, cccsymposium.org, cccsymposium.org is uh, already open uh, for registration and other information you may need. Uh, I think for the, uh, uh, for the entire live case team, the operators as well as us, the moderators of today, uh, so long from New York.